Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for still being here. And um, today is the third lecture for uh, polynomial method in restriction theory. Uh, last time we worked on a toy problem uh, about how to use polynomial partitioning to study uh, the Kakea problem in R2. And we discussed how to decompose our tubes that intersecting an algebra variety a neighborhood of the algebra variety into the tangential part and also the transversal part. And we have proved some lemmas concerning uh, those tangential tubes and transversal tubes. And today we are going to um, study the restriction conjecture in R3. And so we will first um, look at um, how to relate this analysis problem to a problem about tubes. So we have the so last time we discussed the wave packet decomposition in a large ball of radius r. So we first decompose our function f, who is supported on. Uh, sorry, I I should have sent the notes. So let me take a minute to find the notes. Maybe this is easier. Okay, here is uh, the link where you can find the notes for today and for uh, tomorrow. So last time uh, we discussed that if f is a function supported on the unit disk in uh, r to the uh, in r n minus one, then we can first decompose the unit disk into caps of. Uh, into a finitely overlapping caps of radius r to the minus a half. And we do a partition of unity on the frequency space. That's the space where f lies. And then we can cover um, r n minus one. That's the space where f hat lies in by balls of radius um, r to the one half plus a delta. Delta is a very small positive constant. And uh, for this lecture, we just try to ignore it. And, and then do a perform, a, again, a partition of unity on the space where f hat lies in. So this, so decomposing into f theta hat and times phi v is just a partition of unity in the frequency space and also in the physical space where f hat lies. And then um, we also discussed that um, the support of this function, f theta hat times phi v, and then take the inverse Fourier transform, is essentially supported inside two theta. So it's harmless if we uh, multiply by a bump function that is one on two theta, and the support is in four theta. So this is our definition of a single wave packet f theta v. Um, and here is uh, our discussion in the uh, question session with Harold. Like he asks, how different is this function resulting from a uh, partition of unity in two spaces compared to the extra wave packet that we define? So this is. Um, so here is what we discussed. Um, since this function is essentially supported on two theta, so they are not so different. So the conclusion is that they differ by a rapidly decaying power of um, r to the minus capital N, where capital N is arbitrarily large number, and times the L2 norm of f theta. So uh, let me just uh, send the notes for last time in case you were not here and you're you are interested. So 
And this is the notes for last time. And then, so now we have um, defined the wave packet decomposition. Um, we have two lemmas concerning the wave packet decomposition. The first one is the essential support of each EF theta V, so each wave packet um, applied, the, the extension operator is supported on a tube T theta V of length R and radius R to the one half. I think in reality, we need to add a delta here, but we ignore it. And now the theta T theta V is pointing on the direction of um, g theta v, uh, g theta, which is the normal direction of uh, the the normal uh, vector of the center of theta on the paraboloid. So theta we have uh, we, um, so that this is the theta upstairs. And then the second lemma is uh, this. Uh, e f theta v, a single wave packet, if we take the absolute value, then it is a roughly constant on theta v. Um, so let, let's, um, so the second lemma is an application of the uncertainty, uncertainty principle. Let's see um, um, like a hand wavy way of how to understand the second one, and then we will prove the first one. Um, this, so the first four, as we have seen that, um, sorry, this is the support of F theta V lies in four theta. So that means the support of the free transform of E F theta V will live on the, the map from the disk to the parabola it will live on this small cap on on the paraboloid, then we have seen that this small cap, we can cover it by uh, little slabs of radius r to the minus a half and of a little rectangular box of radius r to the minus a half and then a thickness r to the minus one. So this lies in a um, small plate and the normal direction of this plate, plate is exactly g theta. That means that, so if a function whose Fourier transform is supported on some compact, uh, compact convex set, also symmetric, then we have this function itself, if we take absolute value, is locally constant on the dual of this symmetric uh, convex set. So the dual of this little plate is exactly T theta V. Well, V uh, is V will be the origin. So that's a, a, like a hand wavy way of uh, understanding why the uh, way of understanding why this is locally constant. Uh, the the idea is that if a function whose free transform is supported on some small er uh, on the, on a small box, then it should be locally constant on a large box. Okay, so the precise version of lemma one is the following. So the T theta V, if we want to define it carefully, then um, it's parameterized by these equations, uh, these inequalities. So the uh, one, uh, two, um, so this uh, one minus two, um, how to say? minus two epsilon theta is the definition of G theta. And then the lemma says that if X does not lie in uh, the, its essential support, but it lies in the big ball that we start with, then EF theta V is uh, rep satisfy a rapidly, rapidly decaying bound. So we call that the rapidly decaying bound is smaller than a constant times r to the minus n, where n is way larger than one. So for number theorists, 
I think this notation means like larger than constant times one, but in analysis, we mean that it's a lot larger than one. Um, okay, so the sketch proof is, um, is like uh, integration by parts. So since f theta v is supported on four, in four theta, then we can mod, it's harmless to multiply by a, a, a smooth bump function. And then we apply this e to the two pi i v uh, epsilon. Um, we multiply it by the phase function so that its freest transform of this function is supported in the um, in a small disk of radius, um, say, r to the minus a half. And then we have this phase function. And if we define the phase function as such, then uh, the partial cosy of phi is um, x prime, where well, x prime is the first n minus one coordinates of x. Uh, plus 2x and c plus v. So this looks quite similar to the um, to the equation where we used to define t theta v. And then since we are in our ball of radius r centered at origin, so xn is smaller than r, and then c is in the theta, and c theta is the center of theta, so the distance between them is uh, bounded by r to the minus a half. Then this means that, so if we translate the, the assumption that x does not lie in t theta v, it means exactly that this uh, inequality, the reverse of it holds. So this is greater than r to the a half plus two delta. And when we apply integration by parts, if we know that the derivative of the phase function is very large, so we uh, every time we apply integration by a pass, we gain a power of r to the minus half minus two delta. But we, when we do this something over this function and this function, we lose some power on the range of r to the one half. So every time we gain roughly um, um, r to the minus delta, and if we apply it sufficiently many times, we obtain r to the minus capital N. So that that's, uh, there is a question. Does E f theta v continue decaying if x does not lie below? Ah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So let me um, add another page to explain it. So we have a large ball of radius r, and then this is t theta v. So all we know that is when x is here, then it's rapidly decaying. Um, but what, what happens if those f looks like um, if a point x lies in here. So it lies like on the sort of the continuation of the tube. Well, and I think for those points, let's call it y, we do not have rapidly decay. So the, uh, the wave packet decomposition is really uh, with respect to a large ball of um, radius r. And to study what happens here, so what we usually do is we we make another ball of say radius r, um, and then we can uh, multiply of us uh, we can multiply a phase function on f, or or we can do a translation on e f to make this ball to be. Um, the ball centered at the origin, and we redo wave packet decomposition. And now we can study what's the value of uh, EF theta on Y, if, if the EF theta makes sense here. Uh, does it answer your question? Okay.
Yeah, this is something I also wondered when I first studied wave packet decomposition. Um, okay. Um, so let's continue. Um, then we have the so the uh, the wave packet decomposition has many good properties. So the first property is the L two orthogonality uh, for any set of T theta v of tubes. So this is a kind of a result of a partition of unity in both physical frequency space of f and physical space of f hat. And it, so this is, um, well, not uh, completely rigorous because if uh, there, there might be some small overlapping, but after a suitable refinement of f, we can make it make this inequality rigorous. So, so far we just look at this uh, simple version. And then we also have the uh, energy estimate. So the L2 norm of EF on BR is bounded by R2 to one half times the L2 norm of F. And then usually this energy estimate is a roughly equality uh, provided that the uh, wave packets all passes the wave packets of F all passes through BR. And the, the proof is um, if we fixed the Xn coordinate, then the L2 norm is bounded by the L2 norm of F. And then we integrate on the Xn coordinate as an interval of length R. So we have this R to the one half. And then um, the, the proof is uh, applying Prunchard's equality. So when xn is fixed, we can move this xn to an f together with uh, fc. Then this becomes the Fourier, the, what's going inside becomes the Fourier transform of this function. And we are estimating the L2 norm if we uh, integrate only on x1 to xn minus one. So that this is exactly Planchard uh, equality. And then, so the, the very good um, property of EF theta V is that as a corollary of the lemmas we discussed, when we think about this problem, we usually view EF theta V when we take absolute value as some constant depending on the L2 norm of F theta V times the characteristic function of T theta V. Uh, technically, we have a rapidly decaying tail, but uh, when we think about the problem, when we think about how the heuristics, we usually think it's like the characteristic function of T theta V. So here is the picture. So we have EF equals to sum over EF theta V. So this, this EF theta V are a plus arrow. And those EF theta V, when we take absolute value, is a very, very good function. That's just some weight multiplied, some weighted tubes, some weighted tube. But they have oscillation. So when, they, um, when we add them together, this oscillation will play a big role. And the way to explore the oscillation is via those L2 equality, and also via this, this energy estimate. And as we will see. So um, for those of you who have, uh, have not yet seen how restriction conjecture implies KKI conjecture, um, um, well, I, I know this is like well known for analysis people, but uh, let's see. Um, so consider a bump function on theta, so phi theta, then uh, E phi theta as we have seen that it is uh, greater than some, uh, count, some power of R, this does not matter because they are all the same. And then this is greater than some constant times T theta, a tube of radius R to the one half and length capital R. 
centered edge origin. And so we have our T theta, but the Kakea set, set concerns a tube in every direction. We don't know what is the location of the tube. So this T theta now is centered at your origin. Um, we can multiply by a phase, fun uh, by a phase function. Um, so that by this phase function to translate this T theta to any position we like. Uh, the, the orientation is fixed by theta, but we can, um, we can uh, move this, uh, the location of t theta for free. Then we have the new EF theta is larger than a constant on this translated tube. So now let t be a set of tubes in the Kakea set. For each theta, we can, we, we can find a vector such that the translation is in is in our is our tube in T. Then, then we can apply restriction estimate to this um, F. So, so now F is sum over epsilon theta times F theta, where epsilon theta takes uh, plus one minus one with equal probability, and they are independent random variables. And now we can apply Kinchin's inequality. So um, to we, we apply both restriction estimate and Kinchin's inequality on, on this function. Uh, I, I will uh, drop the calculation here, but this is how we show that the restriction conjecture implies the Kakea conjecture. Okay, now, now we start the real proof. Um, so, uh, we, we previously we have um, we have so now we have other tools. The the real proof start with the broad narrow decomposition. Um, so here I state a broad narrow decomposition in R n. Uh, in in uh, for n equals to three, this uh, decomposition is uh, really simple, and it's uh, if it's like it's sort of like the bilinear estimate that people have studied about 20 years ago. But the, the reason why I try to, um, to do it in Rn is because this broad narrow decomposition, I think was uh, developed by uh, Burkana Guth, has, uh, is, is applied in many places, for example, in the decoupling um, um, theory and also restriction theory. So I think this is like now a standard tool. So it's worth studying. Now, uh, the broad narrow decomposition is a way to decompose the LP norm into a broad part and a narrow part. So here, what we are defining, uh, this is the broad part. Now let K be, um, R to the epsilon. So K is, uh, is very large compared to the constant one and very uh, small compared to R. So let A be a parameter that's uh, way smaller than K to the epsilon. So again, this means a, a lot smaller. So for example, it's K to the epsilon square or K to the epsilon cube. So now for any ball of radius K square, and we'll see why this is case well later. And uh, a lot later, maybe tomorrow, <laughs> but it's worth keeping in mind. And uh, so for any ball of radius K square, the broad part of EF is defined as, um, so we are free to choose any A uh, a many k minus one subspaces of Rn. And then we exclude those subspaces. I think I need to draw a picture here. Um, what do we say? So we are, we are free to exclude those subspaces and then um, this tau will is um, 
So the tau are one over k caps. Then the, for, for the remaining ones, um, the max of the integration of EF tau LP on this ball. So let me uh, spoil a little bit and just tell you that um, the set of the set of tau such that the direction g tau that's the normal vector on the paraboloid and a subspace v uh, the angle between them um, is bounded by o, one over k this uh, on b on the unit disk in R and minus one will be lie in the K minus one neighborhood, K to the minus one neighborhood, one over K neighborhood of us, of a K minus two plane W. So, uh, this is the lemma that we are going to prove, but uh, if this helps you to visualize where the location of tau is. So uh, let, let me just translate this uh, definition again. So now in... Hong, just quickly, what is the relation between your k and n? When you say k minus two plane? Uh, this, this is small k. Ah, that, that's a great question. That, 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 that's right to the point. So. Uh, this small k is, we are free to choose whatever we want. So in R3, we usually choose k to be 2. But in Rn, uh, the, the, this k can range from 2 to n minus 1. But the, the most helpful k for now is usually in the middle. But thank you for the question, Lilian. So, so th this might look like a, 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 a like complicated definition. But let, let's uh, let's take it slowly. So now we um, we have this many subspaces where the a is not too large compared to all the parameters that we are considering. So let's just think a as a constant. So a is say let's think think a is a hundred for now. So we we can choose a hundred uh, subspaces as we like. Uh, here now is like a hundred uh, those k minus two plane as we like, and then we look at those tiles that are not intersecting those w's, and then we estimate the maximum. Then then we take the maximum of the LP norm of EF tau on B k squared. Um, there is a um, there's an, there is another way to think about it that's um, perhaps more related to how Buchan and Guth, when they first uh, used this decomposition. So another way is like, now we have a ball of radius k square, and then we decompose the unit disk into tiles, caps of radius one over k. And then we, we, we look at this value, the LP integration, we have the first part say is tau maximum. That, that's the, the maximum tau that, uh, the, the tau that attains the maximum of this LP integral. And we have tau second, tau two, and that's the second largest uh, value for a fixed BK square. And the, the way we choose those subspace, uh, the resulting W is the subspaces that passes through all of them. And so we kill the, the, those last list. And the, the remaining one is like the broad part and relatively small. So if we manage to kill all the uh, large part by those uh, K minus one subspaces, and in this picture is K minus two planes, um, then we, are, we say that we are in the narrow part. If we are not, if we couldn't, kill all those large part, then we are in the broad part. Does it make sense? Um, but um, 
we, we have a lot of time to digest this definition because when we are in R3 and K equals to two, this is really simple. So the, the picture is that imagine each wave packet, those tubes are the wave packet has roughly the same uh, weight. So it, we have a point, so the red point say, let's, let's just imagine it's like BK square, square. Then if the wave packets, the wave packet through it is like uh, lies in a narrow range of angle, then we, we say that it's narrow. And if the wave packet through it like uh, spread out in all directions, then we say it's broad. So when, when, I, when I think about a uh, broad narrow decomposition, I usually think about those pictures. So the, the number of uh, subspaces just means that now we allow to have A of those fat tubes. Um, and, and this is the definition of the, um, the broad part, the broad uh, BLP norm, the, the broad LP norm. And so it's uh, defined as for, for actually, I think for any uh, U that is tied by those BK square, we define a broad LP norm of U as summing over a finitely over, um, overlapping covering of using BK square and then take this norm that we just defined. Um, so uh, using some trick, you can say that this broad LP norm, K broad LP norm is bounded by this K linear norm. So this is not actually true, but we, we, it's true up to some, uh, uh, some, some random translation of EF. So I, I will make a quotation here. And maybe this one, the, the K linear norm is more familiar to people. But um, why are we considering this broad alpinum, K broad alpinum is because it works better with uh, polynomial partitioning. So far, I think mm, no one knows how to do polynomial partitioning using those K linear norm. So th that is also the reason why uh, there are papers about how to estimate this uh, K broad norm of EF but not so many people, or maybe even not, not too many people knows how to uh, estimate the K-linear norm of EF. Okay, um, I think, I hope people are following so far. I will pause and see if there are questions. Yes, can I ask you a question? I'm not following, actually. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, in the definition of this mu EF, you say max tau equals angle g tau va. I'm just confused because there's tau equals angle of g tau. Like it seems like a recursive sort of thing. Uh -huh. But I, I just see two taus. Oh. And also I, I wasn't sure what f tau was. So if you could cl clarify what that is, that'd be great. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, f leaves, let me add another page since you all have the notes, then, uh, so this is BM minus one zero one and tau is now a cap of radius one over K. Then F, uh, so F lives in this, uh, is supported on this unit disc. Then F tau is defined as F times a bump function supported on tau. That's just, uh, you can think of, F tau as F restricted on tau, if you want. And then, um, so here, what I just mean is that the set of tau is not equal, sorry, maybe my notation is bad. It's a point, it's a um, tau such that tau two point, does it? it does it look better? Yes, it makes sense now. Thanks. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you for your question. Uh, any other question? Okay. So, um, we have the, um, so the, this K broad L P norm, um, we, it's, it's kind of like the usual norm. So we have the triangle inequality and holders inequality if we are willing to sacrifice the value of A. So the A is like relatively large compared to one. And actually that's the reason why we want to take A uh, large compared to one. Um, I think at the beginning, uh, I, I was in my mind, I was always thinking A equals to one, but, but then we need to apply some kind of triangle inequality and holders inequality, then A equals to one is, is, is not working well. And that, 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 this is exactly the reason why we take A to be large. And so those two inequalities, I think it will be a good exercise if you uh, want to prove it and it's not too hard and you, by proving it, you have a like, sort of better understanding why we define the K-broad norm this way. And here is uh, from how to go from the uh, K-broad estimate to the LP estimate that we, are, uh, we want to prove. So it's uh, relatively easy for K equals to two. For K greater or equal to three, we shall apply the decoupling inequality proved by Bochgen and Demeter. So now, uh, since we are only considering k equals to two in dimension three, let's uh, look at. So um, by the definition of the um, BL2 norm, we have this inequality. So the reason is that when k, small k equals to two, then previously we said that k minus two um, plane w, we exclude those uh, a many k minus two plane w. Now k minus two plane is just becomes a single point. So that says that we are allowed to exclude uh, a caps and then the rest of them, we take the maximum. So this is the caps tau that we have excluded. And so, so this is, um, I think this is related to say a to some power. So we have excluded some caps and then we use some holders inequality to make it into a little LP sum. So maybe I will write more details. Um, okay. LP is bounded by the this broad part. And for the broad part, we are willing to sacrifice any power of n, uh, any power of k, uh, so like n, polynomial power of k. And that's just the number of tiles, for example, multiply by this broad norm. And so the broad part. And then the narrow part will we use uh, since something like um, Va. So there are a many of them and E, F, tau, let's say A. And so this is by triangle inequality that the broad part, it will be estimated by this thing. And then the narrow part, oh, sorry, I shouldn't take P here the, because when we apply triangle inequality, we don't have uh, the pith power. And then this part, we will just use uh, say a uh, holder. So we lose, the constant we lose is like something depending on A. 
which is small compared to k. And the reason why um, the value of them are different is, is that for the narrow part, we will use induction. And so it's very important that the, the thing we the, the constant we lose here is relatively small compared to the, the the like the size of induction. But this for the broad norm, we are going to estimate it directly. So it is okay as long as the constant is small compared to R. So recall that uh, K is like bounded by R to the epsilon, and A is much less than K to the epsilon. And so so this is the uh, the inequality we get for k equals for small k equals to two like two broad norm. Uh, is this okay? Okay. And now let me uh, just uh, discuss uh, for the narrow part. We said that we are going to use induction, but how we how are we going to use induction? We will apply the parabolic rescaling on EF tau. So the, the parabolic rescaling says that if tau is a cap of radius one over K, that's defined as such. Then we, the, so here is the way how we do parabolic rescaling. We, uh, and we let H be a function supported on the unit disk. That is a rescaling of F tau. Then we calculate those. What what is E H the extension operator applied on H? Then we apply. Uh, we have well, we obtain some scaling of it. And I, I will uh, drop this calculation here. So the idea, the key idea is here. So we do a um, we we do a rescaling, and then this. The, the problem about EF tau will become a problem about estimating the LP number for EH, but inside a smaller ball, so we can apply induction. So assuming that we know what happens when the radius of the ball is smaller. So now the main difficulty is to how to estimate the BL2 norm of EF. So this is in R3. So in R3, um, if you do the previous calculation about the narrow part carefully, you will see that we, we have no loss for the narrow part in R3. So in R3, as long as we get a very good estimate about the BL2 norm, uh, the, sorry, the two broad norm of EF, we will get a good estimate about the LP norm of F. But the same thing is not going to be true in higher dimension for some K. Okay, so the theorem of uh, Guth in 2014 is, is the following. For, K, for P equals to 3.25, uh, we, we write this, we write BLP um, for simplicity, but it really means BLP2A. Then the um, BLP norm of EF on a large ball is bounded by something. Um, so there are a few things. Uh, the, the conjecture in N equals to three is the range P greater than three. And then uh, as we have seen earlier is that as long as, as we have F infinity on the right-hand side by some factorization theorem, we will have the uh, uh, LP norm on the right-hand side. So uh, even though the right-hand the right -hand side looks, looks complicated, but you will see that it's all bounded by the L infinity norm of F. So now let's see. So there is a part about L2 norm, and there is a part about an approximation of L infinity norm. So this 
f theta l2 average is like we integrate the l2 norm of f theta and then divide by the volume of theta and take one half. Um, so those powers are not so important. Uh, I just stated here because this was the theorem that Larry proved. But when we think about a problem, we try to ignore the, the, the powers and see uh, what should we put there. Um, so, but there is something to say that why, why we want a mix of the L2 norm and an approximation of the L infinity norm. So this is, um, as we'll see late, later, this is um, because of the previous L2 uh, equality, like sum over F, the, the L2 norm of F theta V is roughly the same as the L sum over um, the L2 norm of theta, F theta V is roughly the same as F the L2 norm of F. And so here we can, um, it, when we have an L2 norm here, we can exploit, exploit uh, those oscillation. And this one is works, we Larry uh, use this approximation of L, F, L infinity norm is just because it's like using L2 norm to approximate L infinity norm, but L2 norm works better for induction because of this equality. So this allows us to, uh, to study those wave packet decomposition in different scales and relate them to each other, but the same thing will not hold for L infinity norm. Okay, that's enough of the discussion for uh, the statement, why it looks this way. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so now um, now we are, we are here to uh, look at the proof. Um, so this proof at the, the, the starting point will look very similar to the uh, proof or to the sketch proof of the toy problem we, we saw last time. So now let uh, d to be a large constant only depending on epsilon. And then we apply polynomial partitioning on this uh, norm. So the assumption of polynomial partitioning is that we apply on a, pos like a function that is uh, greater or equal to zero. Uh, which is true on the new EF ER. I think this will be, yeah. And so this BR will, will look like a measure. So it takes value on the, those. It, so mu EF, it, it looks like a measure. We can apply mu EF on the set U. So this will be like our G. And then to find a polynomial Q, of degree bounded by this d we choose earlier. And then um, we, uh, we modify our polynomial a little bit. We multiply it by a, a simple polynomial g, where g parameterizes the grid of distance r over d that the discrete that intersects BR. So, so this is um, a, a small modification that I like, but you, you don't really need it in, in this proof, but I, I like because it uh, helps me to visualize things. So, so we make a small modification and then the, the degree, of, degree of G is like bounded by 3D because the set of uh, say planes intersecting uh, BR and the planes as as the spacing R over D is like bounded by 3D in, in three different dire dimensions, directions. So that means that the degree of Q prime is also bound is bounded by 4D. So it's like on, on the same magnitude. And then we define oh, and then we define the zero set of Q prime, the new polynomial as Z, and we take, we define the wall W as the um, R to the one half plus delta neighborhood of Z. Um, 
So here I'm probably going a little bit fast because we have seen it uh, last time. And it, it's the, so the first part is like essentially the same. And then what we know is that the complement of W, um, I think this is, we can make this to be BR because we are in, only interested in BR. The complement of W will be uh, decomposed into cells OJ and the number of cells is bounded by d cube, a uh, constant times d cube. And each cell lies inside an r over d ball, a, a ball of radius r over d. So this is the result of us multiplying by this grid g. And this is the most important inequality that results from polynomial partition is that the BLP norm of EF in each cell is below average. So it's bounded by D to the minus three times the BLP norm in the whole ball. And, and as before, we uh, decompose it into algebraic case and cellular case. So we, we discussed how to uh, treat the algebraic case. So now we define it to be algebraic case if the BLP norm of EF on a ball on, on BR is bounded by the BLP norm of EF on a uh, wall W. So it's like the neighborhood of algebraic variety. And then the idea as before is we cover Um, we cover the wall by both B rho of radius rho equals to R to the minus, R to the one minus delta. Well, delta is, I think here delta is the same delta that we try to ignore. So that, that, that's the uh, thickness. So recall that the away packet, if we want to define it properly, then it has a radius R to the one half plus delta. And they are the same delta that is um, small positive and much smaller than the epsilon that we want to prove in our theorem. And then we uh, write S equals to W intersect B rho. So um, I sometimes call this S as a fat surface. And we define the TS tangential as the set of tubes satisfying that the tube intersecting our ball lies in S. And also we have some assumption about the angle. So that is for any X inside, say for example here, for any, for any X in, inside uh, the tube intersecting B row, this is B row, and this one is T theta V. And for any Z, I didn't draw Z here, but let me draw it. Let's say this is Z. For any Z also inside also in, inside the, uh, the B row, such that the distance between X and Z is bounded by uh, the radius of the tube. Then we have, then we require that the, the angle between uh, g theta, that's actually the direction of the tube. For this tube, this is g theta. Between g theta and the tangent plane. So here we are in R3 and Z is a two dimensional algebraic variety. So we have the tangent plane, the angle between the direction of the tube and the tangent plane is bounded by R to the minus a half um, plus two delta. So this is the definition. And, and it's, it's essentially the same as the definition of the tangential tube we have seen last time. And then we define the set of transversal tube with respect to S as the set of tubes intersecting S 
and they are not tangential. So now we define the tangential part of F and the transversal part of F. And so we have this uh, inequality. Um, note that those S uh, will cover or uh, will be about the same as it will be the same as W and those S are finitely overlapping. So, and here is by, we have E, F, S, sorry, E, F, B, L, P, S is bounded by E, F, S tangential, B, L, P, S plus E, F, S transversal, B, L, P, S. So the reason is that uh, since we have the, our lemma about essential support of the wave packets, then only those wave packets intersecting S matters. And the wave, packet in this, the wave packets intersecting S, we have already decomposed it into either a tangential one, or it, either it belongs to the tangential one, or it belongs to the transversal one. So we have by, by the triangle inequality that we have studied, now this is true. And, and then when we take the piece power, we will lose a power of P, a uh, uh, constant depending only on P. And this explains how do we have the decomposition. And then I, I think I will save the discuss uh, for how to bond them next time. Okay, I will stop.